third group that I want to talk to you about tonight. And this is, hopefully, will clear up some things. Because I think there are a lot of folks out there who do not read Greek, including some scholars, that's just such a contradiction, that it becomes obvious. If you were to look up this word group and in the theological dictionary, this word group occurs on page 88 if you have one of these. And if you don't, you can probably look it up online or take my word. Now, this word group, when we look at these words, they are all hag, this one is hagios, this one is hagiazo. I, I need to do this to show you why um, hagiasmos, hagiotes, I'll write it just like it looks, and here, hagio sune. Now, we can look at the letters, the Greek letters. I'm going to say them in English, A or A uh, and G, right, G. There's another group of words. This other group of words that occurs in the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, which occurs on page 122. And if you take a real good look, and even if you don't read Greek, if you take a good look here, I want you to see what's different. You've still got the A with the reverse aspirate, the G, but look at the letter that comes next. N, agnos, agnizo. And why am I pointing this out to you? Because you can definitely see there are two different words, correct? Yes, ma'am. Good. Okay. So if somebody were to be doubtful, that these are two separate words, and if you should happen to have the Englishman's Greek concordance of the New Testament, you can look in here, and that second word grouping um, will appear, for example, and see if you can see that, 48 is simply the, the word grouping, and versus, if we were to look at the word grouping of our first group of words, you can see up here, hagio. So they're even listed separately and distinctly. Now, why is this important? The word group that has this different letter, right? Different. Let me read you what it says about this word, hagnos. And think, I'm going to emphasize for tonight, the N, the N sound, versus the hagios, hagia. So you can, you can see there's a letter there. Now somebody real quick would look at this and who's not familiar with Greek would say, well, they're the same thing because they come from a grouping of, of words that are ag. But it doesn't work like that. So this second group of words, agnos, agnizo, do not make the mistake that it is related to um, our words for agnostic, that is a different Greek word. But this word in the dictionary, page 122, for that second group of words that possesses the N. Agnos, like hagios, I'm using hagnos, like hagios, is a verbal adjective of hag hagosomai or hagzomai. It originally signifies that which awakens religious awe. Etymologically, it is linked with Old Indian yaj, which is to reverence or sacrifice, and not with the Latin sacer. It is not related to it. So why this is important, when you start to look up this second group of words, here's what you come up with. Now, let me go back to this, because this lists those words and gives you the English, all right, so from the Englishman's Greek concordance of the New Testament, this second word with the N, we have it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven times spelt hagnizo. If it is occurring with the N, 
what you are having consistently translated in your King James is the word purify. Purification, purify, purified. Purity. Now, you can take the same root or the same word and go through its various um, cognates or the, the, the words that are closest to it in the same family. You will end up with words like hagnismos, not hagios, hagnismos. That is purification. And then there's another word, another group, um, still related to this, hagnos. This, we've got several different ways of translating in the King James, clear, chaste, pure. Um, so you get the idea, or even um, hagnotes. I'm, I'm trying to emphasize the N for you. Pureness. Um, sometimes hagnos, sincerely. So. Why am I doing this? And some of you are already, you're already there. The N grouping, ag N, right? Hag N. Are you understanding when I'm distinguishing between these two words because they're so close? Okay. In the New Testament, hagnizo is used in John 11.55 of the cultic purification of the Jews prior to the Passover. It is then used of cultic purification within the Jewish Christian community in Jerusalem, which kept to the Old Testament law and laid on Paul a demand of this kind. They're referencing back to Acts 21 and 24. The ongoing participation of the primitive community in the temple cultists made observance of the tr traditional external cultic regulations unavoidable. In particular, visiting the temple after returning from the Gentile world demanded additional cultic purification. New Testament religion did not fashion any such rules of its own, hence this aspect drops away as um, the New Testament religion attains fuller understanding of itself. However, the term occasionally finds a new use to denote full moral purity as the decisive presupposition for the reception of salvation. The reason why I'm highlighting this is because this is the confusion when people talk about purity and moral purity and the word grouping which occurs infrequently in the New Testament. Infrequently. I, I counted, what did I say, seven or eight times that word occurs. It's very infrequent and it's, it is, when it occurs each time, it is re regarding purification, the process of purification. Usually in context to either the Pharisees or the time the appointed time when something was happening and in the New Testament, a description of, and it was the days of purification, I'm giving you this example. Versus all of these other words which do not have anything to do with this word grouping that has the N on it. They're, they're close. They are, they are literally 30 pages apart in the dictionary, but they're two different words. So now take people who have failed to see and distinguish between these two words because quite frankly if you're reading Greek and you are not proficient at it you could very easily confuse these words which many people have including two scholars as I was going through all of my material and was mortified that they would have included that as part of a definition the word grouping that I'm highlighting here I'm using the N as the accent to distinguish they have homogenized because when you look at this book, the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, and you start with that section that begins describing hagios, here's what happens. And I just want the cameraman to take, or the director, just to take the first five words here. The, and that's a G, right? So a G family of Greek words is most extensive. So people who are not making certain of what they're reading may just group this in because they think it's an AG word and it belongs in the category of these words, but it does not. So I'm, I'm really needing to stress this because this is part of where all of this purity and how you will abstain, abstinence, comes in and muddies the definition of hagios. And here's where 
we, we, we almost have a point of contact in the words, but not really. You will find that the, the source, by and large, with, we're dealing with Greek whenever it's talking about the saints, for example, the, to the saints at Ephesus. Well, it is presupposed that these people were, Paul is calling them saints because they have obviously received salvation and they are part of the church, they are fathers. So in each and every situation where you're going to encounter this word, whether it's saints, whether it's holy, holiness, the, the emanation, the genesis of this attribute is coming from God to us. Even when we are called saints, we're not saints of ourselves. We're saints because God called and chose us, but the attribute, the, we'll call it the spiritual currency that's poured into us, comes, flows from this hagios word versus the word hagnos and hagnizo and all of its derivatives which describe functions that may be apart from God. Why? Because in the cultic temples and in the outside of the Jewish temple and outside of the synagogue, this word hagnos was used. So you can't start homogenizing the word and saying, well, we're just going to graft it on because it's so close, similar, and it denoted some cultic practices outside of, well, now let's fast forward it to the New Testament. So by and large, this word is going to be used, the hagnizo, hag, hagnos. Those words are going to be used in conjunction with or to describe cleansing, purity, um, more of the ritual state or more of abstinence versus something that is given to us in the form of an attribute, a dimension of God that is given to us. Does that make sense to you what I just said? Now, do you understand why I'm trying to keep going at this? Because I see people take the definition of this hagnos group of words, purity, morality, ethics, whatever you want to call it, but it has nothing to do with what we're talking about when we're describing or trying to define sanctification and holiness. Now, when I said things touch and then they branch off, it, it's assumed already that this, if, if all the holiness and sanctification words, if all of that is sourced in God, then where it touches is God is pure. He is the ultimate definition of purity. Or, so you can say, yes, the, the word touches there in that form, but that's about it because the second word grouping with the N emphasis was not specifically and distinctly used for Judaic or Christian purposes. So this is something, as I said, I want to introduce it. We will start developing and going through, but there's, there is an interesting element to this because once you get into these words and you start defining and making sure that we understand, we're dealing with two separate word groups. Then there are additional word groups that we will have to take into consideration that are either antonyms or synonyms. But unlike the Hebrew antonyms or synonyms, these things will actually crystallize for us even more so. So the goal right now is to separate these word groups. And if I can kind of read a little bit, this my only problem with this dictionary, with the theological dictionary, I love to read it, but it can be very verbose, and I don't think that they design this dictionary uh, for somebody like me to sit here and read to you because intermittently what they do is they put, mm, they're talking about a definition, then they'll have quotes. Those quotes occur in Greek and they are not translated, and I have no problem reading Greek to you, but I don't think it's of any use. So I sometimes will jump through this book because I'm trying to Make sure we all understand. I'm not trying to confuse. Claro? Okay. So let me take you to the, the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament for the uh, New Testament 
hagios first, and then I'm going to look at that second word grouping again. So what's interesting in the dictionary here, hagios in the New Testament, and the first heading in here, they have them enumerated, the first one, number one, the holiness of God. Now, what's interesting about this is, I like that they started this because this, the way they are setting this article up, you cannot escape. You can't even fabricate that holiness is something other than coming from God. It belongs to Him. He actually dispenses it to us. The second heading that they have in this dictionary is Jesus Christ as Hagios, which is actually rare does not occur often. I think the references, and I'm not even looking, I'm going to tell you, I believe the references are to the um, early sections of Luke, or oh, anywhere where it's before Jesus is born, and the reference to the Holy Spirit leaping in the belly of Mary, or that she was with child, there the references to the Holy Child. So it is rare, but it occurs. Okay, then we've got a plethora, and it's, as you know, Holy Spirit. That is a huge section in here, and I don't think I need to touch on that because I think it's self-evident. So they've, what they've done, what I love about what they've done with this article is they have immediately set up holiness as belonging to the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There isn't uh, a section that begins with, you saints, you fabricate it, you act it, you uh, imitate it. Because, see, at the end of all of this, what I want the takeaway to be from this study is that there is so much confusion. No wonder why movements were, were born, like um, specifically uh, the Methodist movement, that was really birthed out of a desire for people to return to some concept of purity, and purity as in the world is polluted, the world is sinful, um, and if we, can, if we can get back to, this was the mindset in that movement, um, if we can get back to a certain place, we will be closer with God. I mean, it, on the surface it sounds like a great thing. The problem is, unless I am the only person on earth who understands what Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned, and that's not just putting it in the past, that's all have sinned, as in all sin all the time. There is no way. Oh, you can, you can go live on a, an island somewhere and remove all of the pollutants of life, and you could remove all of the tangibles, but you cannot remove the stain that is in the mind. You cannot remove that. That's, we're, we're born with that, and unless you're in the Word, which brings me to another word group that we'll deal with to better understand hagios, which is the word group that I've already dealt with previously, a couple of years ago, the word that I've used, catharize, catharizo. Jesus says you're clean by the Word. So right away there, and this word, it will be definitely attached to our understanding of holiness and sanctification. If you are clean through the word katharos or katharos, and the, in some places the antithesis of holiness is akatharos, putting the A and throwing it in reverse, unclean. So somewhere, we'll find that reference, Hold that thought, because there's only one way to do this. Um, let's see here. And if you're wondering what's going on on radio, I'm turning the pages of my Strong's Concordance. All right, unclean. We're looking for that. Unclean. I'm looking for a particular reference here. So let's see, it would be a New Testament reference right here. Let's see if we can find this. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, if you'd like to turn there, and if not, I will read you what it says.
1 Thessalonians 4, 7 says, For God hath not called us to uncleanness, but unto holiness. 167. I just want to make sure, even though I know what the word is, I'm going to make double sure that it's actually that word. 167. 167. Akatharsia. So, this is why I said it's, it's, it's best to understand the words that we're dealing with sometimes with helping words. This reference I just read, God hath not called us to uncleanness, that A, putting in reverse, uncleanness, but unto holiness. So, just this transition right here and what I referenced out of John 15, you are made clean through the word, you are catharized through the word. This is why when people say you have to do something to become pure, they're confused. Purity is not even in the pot right now. We're talking, when Jesus says to his disciples, you are clean through the word, Jesus is the word, he spoke the word, so when we, we, we're going at it this way, the idea of being made clean is not through ritual. Remember, this hagnos word carries with it ritual, carries with it the type of things that would be attached to, let's just say, in general, any temple worship, whether it be cultic, pagan, or other. So the word doesn't even attach. I'm hoping that what I'm saying is clear, and I'm definitely going to repeat this. This whole uh, lesson needs to be laid out in such a way that for the people who maybe have succumbed to confusion, we can separate these words, clarify them, and make clear that the muddiness between these two words on the, on the basis that people have just kind of homogenized them is what has thrown much of the confusion into the New Testament and into the church world. When you step away from this, you realize something. This is the problem. The people who have uh, embarked on these, what I've called, holiness movements, abstaining from certain foods and abstaining from certain activities, God did not. I mean, that may have been true in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, we're told all things are clean, all things are made clean through Him. So how could we get this definition so wrong. How could we get to the point when somebody's talking about holiness, the holiness movement, the Shakers, the Quakers, the people who you, you put them in a, a moral cubicle, but that is not the doctrine of holiness in the Bible. And I'm hoping that when I'm done with this, this will be so abundantly clear that people who still lean on this, either the expression, I'm no saint, because that's somebody else, it's not me. If you're a believer, you're a father, and you're trusting in Christ, you're a saint. And you're not a dead saint, you're an alive saint. If you want to be a dead saint, you can go join the Catholic Church. And, and that's even risky because, you know, you have to enter a lottery to figure out if you actually merit the title of sainthood. If you're really interested in what happens to us as fathers, being cleansed by the Word, which is why we're told to stay in the Word and to keep washing our minds with it. This is the way, if somebody's going to make the mistake of talking about mental thought process of purity, which we, we don't ever obtain, however, the Word cleanses our mind. So you can see where this, if there's a little gray area where people might say, well, that's close enough, but it's not this outward performance and ritual ceremony stuff that belongs to the grouping of words that I said is not a part of the words we're studying. So I hope this is clear, and I'm definitely going to try and keep hashing away at this to make sure that uh, once we move on from this, everybody understands and there is hopefully no confusion left, because this is what's, what has messed up and made a shipwreck for many people. 
And I, I said to you many years ago, my mission is to find the truth and to preach it. And when I say find the truth, I do realize that a lot of our versions, the, the words that King James, NIV, any of the versions can even there create confusion. Uh, King James is one. If you read the NIV, they were a little bit more consistent in translating the word so that when it was being translated to denote, for example, a verb or an adjective, they were a little bit more consistent. I don't know why the King James and maybe some of the English grammar rules that definitely changed for sure, um, but they just made, they made it even worse. They exacerbated the situation by not being consistent so that we could actually have a cohesive understanding. Hence, we go to the Greek and we pick this apart. So this is the start. That's the only introduction I'm going to do on this. Next time we touch on this word, we will be digging in, sleeves rolled up to try and really sort this out crystal clear. I hope that it makes sense to you, but if it doesn't, keep watching. Get on the telephone. Come with you, this house.